O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O Arglwy Thain Brenin, my de enw di mor fawr drwy'r byd i gyd. Mae de esblander yn gorchyddio'r nefoedd yn gyfan. Gyda lleisiau plant bach a babanod, rwy'n yn dangos dy nerth, yn wynib dy lynion, i roi diwedd ar y gelyn sy'n hoffi diol. Wrth edrych allan i'r gofod, a gweld gwaith dy fysedd, y llead a'r sedd a osodais dyn eich lle. Beth ydy pobl i ti, gweni amdan unrhyw, pam cymryd sylw o un persol dylo. Rwyt wedi ei wneud ond ychydig i snarbodau nefol, ac wedi ei goroni ac ysblander a mawredd. Rwyt wedi ei wneud yn ffeistr ar waith dyddwylo a gosod popeth dan ei awdurdod. Defai da ichen o bob math a hyd yn oed ar anfeliad gwylltion, yr adar sy'n hedfan, y pysgod sy'n y môr, a phopeth arall sy'n teithio ar geryn tu moeroedd. O argrwydd ein brenin, mae dy enw di môr fawr drwy'r byd i gyd. Let us pray. 
Oh God, it occurs to us that our prayers are sometimes one-sided. So today our prayer is not only for the usual things we pray for, but also for opposite things. We pray today not only for the sick, but the well, lest pride rule our happy hearts. We pray not only for the poor, but also the rich who find it so hard to enter the kingdom of heaven. We pray not only for the troubled, but also for the favored, lest peace with the world be confused with the peace of God. We pray not only for the dying, but also for the living, since they face eternity as well. And we pray not only for the burdened, but also for the casual, lest indolence rot the soul. We pray not only for missionaries on foreign shores, but also for the rest of us who still don't know that in Christ there is no east nor west, north nor south, but one great human family in a house that grows smaller and smaller by the years. We pray not only for ministers of the gospel, but also for people of the gospel, since all who believe are called to be doers of the word and not hearers only. We pray not only that sinners turn and be saved, but also for the rest of us who think we have no sin and are in greater need of penitence and healing. And finally, Lord, we pray not only for others, but also for ourselves, because salvation and righteousness begins at the foot of your throne. And all these things we ask in the words your Son gave us, saying, Ein tat irhunon noi nevath sanctae dier deninu dele de danas genela de erithris megis unen anaf fethli arun thethevit duru i ininethiu ein bara binun ethio amathai inin ein deledien Feli mathai ein in ein in deledivir, aknag ar wen ni i brovirgeth, aithigar wen ni rak drug, kanas aitha ti judo danas, ar natha gagonyant, on ois ois ois. Amen.
Mae'r darlleniaid oddiwrc, marc, penod deg, adnodau, un deg saith i tri deg un. Ac a wedi iddo fanad allan i'r ffordd, redodd un ato, ac o stangodd iddo, ac a o fanodd iddo. O atro da, beth a anaf fel y ti ffeddi oedd fawi trafwyddol. Ar iesu a ddiwedodd wrtho. Baha ma gelw fi, fi yn dda, nid oes neb da ond un, sef diw. Ti o wyddast a gorch y manion. Na hodi neba, na ladd, na ladrata, na chamdastio laitha, na chamgorlleda, a'n rydydda da dad a thfam. Antai a tebodd ac a ddiwedodd wrtho, a thro, a rai hyn i gyd a gydwais o'm hiangted. Ar iesu gan edrych ar nhw, a'i hoffodd ac a ddiwedodd wrtho. Un peth sy'n ddyfagiol i ti, dos gwerth ar hyn oll sydd genet a dyro i'r tlodian, a ti a gedrasor an y nef. A tharad, a chamar i fyny a groes a dilyn fi. Ac a fe a brydd haath wrth ar y madroth, ac a aeth y maeth yma trist, canas a roedd ganddo feddianau lawer. Ar iesu a dredu choch o'n gamgylch, ac a ddiwedodd wrth aeth i sgablion. Mor anodd ar arrai a mae golid ganddynt i derna siw. Ar ddisgyblu yna bro a chas ond wrth a'i aeri a'i ef, ond yr iesu a atebodd drach hyfyn ac a ddiwedodd wrthynt. O blant, mor anodd yw i'r rhaid sydd a'i hamddiriad yn a'i golid fynnad i derna siw. Y mae e'n haws i gamol fynnad trwy grair nodwydd nac i olidog fynnad i mewn i derna siw. A hwy a synas yn ddanthu'r fawr, gan ddiwedodd wrth yn ta'i hynain. A ffwy a all fod yn gadwedig. Ar iesu, a wedi i drinc arnynt a ddiwedodd. Gyda danion am hosibl yw, ac nid gyda diw, can ys popeth sydd bosibl gyda diw. Yn ai a dechrau oedd peir ar ddiwedod wrth o, Wela, na ni a a daws yn bopeth ac a thil yn as yn di. Ar iesu a a tebodd ac i wedodd. Yn wir, meddwl fi chi, nid oes neb ar ar a dawodd di. Na i frodir, na i chwiorydd, na i dad, na i fam, na i o raig, na i blant, na i diroedd. Ym hachos i ar y fengl. A'r ni dderbyn â can cymaint ar awron y pryd hwn. Dau, a brodir, a chwiorydd, a mamau, a phlant, a thiroedd, anghyd ac erlidiau, ac yn y byd a ddaw, fywyd tragwyddo. Ond llawer rhai cyntaf a fyddant ddiweddaf, a'r ddiweddaf fyddant cyntaf. And you are our grief. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. What must I do to be saved? That's the question the young, rich ruler wants to know. It's the one he asks. And, as you know from the story, he was a bit surprised at the answer. Martindale tells the following story. A falling out between father and son. And it goes like this. There was a wealthy man, who, young man, who expected to receive a sports car upon his graduation from university. And on that great day, he went into his father's study 
And his father greeted him and told him that he loved him and handed him a wrapped up present. And when he opened it, he found it to be a box containing a leather Bible. His name was inscribed upon the front of it. The young man was rather confused by this, and then he became angry. He tossed the Bible on the father's desk and stormed out, saying, With all your money, all you can give me is a miserable Bible. And they never spoke again, despite the fact that the young man's father tried hard to contact him for many, many years. As time passed, the father grew old and eventually died, and the son one day got a call to say that his father had passed on and left him everything. As he was going through his father's belongings, he found that Bible still in its box. Curious, he took out the Bible and he opened it. And the page fell open at a passage that his father had marked. It was Matthew 7, verse 11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father give you what is good? And as he read it, a car key fell out from inside the Bible. It had a tag with the dealer's name on it, and it was the sports car they had always wanted. And on the tag was written the graduation date, And the words, paid in full, love dad. The young man missed the present of the car. And more importantly, missed the wonderful present of his father and his love. All because of his greed. In our gospel, in our our lesson today, we confront another rich young man. This young man is concerned, he says, for the things of God. And so he came to Jesus and asked him what he needed to do to inherit eternal life. He seemed to be a good person. No one doubts when he says, look at all the good things I do. But for Jesus, that simply wasn't good enough. Jesus, after all, wasn't interested in people who just do good things. He wasn't interested in those who believed that salvation was merely a a matter of accruing debits and credits on the ledger of life. And there's a simple reason for that. Jesus recognized that people could act ethically without ever having a relationship with the one true God. The pagans, after all, espoused an ethical theory, one that included some version of Plato's four cardinal virtues of prudence and courage, temperance, and justice. And moreover, modern pagans espouse a system of ethics that is hardly uh, distinguishable from many modern churches. I went looking this week, in fact, and I found the website of the Pagan Federation of England and Wales. Yes, there is such a thing. And it indeed publishes a code of ethics for its members. A code which says this, in many other things. Pagans have respect. Pagans value the dignity and worth of all individual. They recognize and celebrate diversity and actively distance themselves from those who are prejudiced. Pagans value their responsibilities to the world around them, including its people, the environment, and the natural world, and especially the creatures that inhabit our world. And pagans value honesty and fairness in their interactions with all people and seek to promote integrity in all facets of their endeavors. In reading that statement, I don't find anything particularly objectionable. As life plans go, it's probably as good as any. It basically tells us that pagans should strive to be nice people. But yet missing is one very important thing. And that is Jesus. 
or indeed any connection to the actual creator of the world they profess to admire. Put another way, modern pagans profess a desire to live decent and peaceful lives, and that is, of course, a good thing. But if you notice, they do not anywhere tell us why anyone should want to do so. I'm led to wonder, therefore, what exactly are the consequences if I violate the duty to value honesty and fairness? More importantly, why should I value the earth if when I die I simply return to nothingness? And I don't mean to be rude, but one can wander into many churches around the world and hear essentially the same thing, that we're all called to be nice but without any explanation as to why Jesus' call to niceness is any more valid or urgent than that of the pagan federation. It is today's story that gives us the answer, however. For when the rich young man tells Jesus that he is a good person and does not harm those around him, Jesus, as I say, is rather unimpressed. And so he confronts the rich man with the essential challenge of the gospel. What shall I do to inherit eternal life, the man wants to know. And Jesus' response is hardly affirming. It is in reality earth-shattering, at least for the young man. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. You see the man's response. He was, we are told, shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Jesus thus touched that day on the area that the young man was not willing to give to God. His wealth, his property, his place. At that point in his life, the rich man was not willing to give up the things of this world in order to obtain the promises of the next. And so he went his own way, apparently intent on working out his own salvation in his own good time and in his own fashion, which probably means that he decided to try to earn his way into heaven by doing good deeds. Now, many people are prone to confuse what Jesus is saying here. Indeed, his listeners on that day certainly did. Because when they observe the encounter, they are horrified. Who can be saved, they wonder. But they misunderstood what Jesus is saying. And so do many today when Jesus says that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter into the kingdom of God. For Jesus is not calling us to impoverish ourselves. Instead, what he is saying is that our adherence to the things of this world is what holds us back from a true relationship with him. We remain stuck on earth, not merely by gravity, but by our refusal to put earthly things in their rightful place. Paul makes this point more succinctly in 1 Timothy when he tells us that it is the love of money that is the root of all evil. Note, I say, that passage is perhaps the most misunderstood and misquoted in all of the Bible. It is not money itself, Paul says, but it is the love of money. It is the root of all evil. And for the rich young man that day, it was his stumbling block. We never actually do find out what happens to the rich young man. We are told that he goes away. Perhaps he did become a later disciple of Jesus. But discipleship, the kind of discipleship that Jesus is talking about here today, is really rather strident. Discipleship for Jesus is all about following him, not merely doing good things for other people. Discipleship is more than simply believing in God. 
Jesus requires more than simply believing in the notion of God and coming to worship once a week. In fact, he wants us to go further if we are to be a disciple. He requires commitment and he demands total surrender. I've told this story many times. In fact, I told it this morning. So those who were there heard it. Just pretend you didn't hear it. In the late 19th century, and in fact 1859, Blondin was a famous tightrope walker. And he had a tightrope placed across Niagara Falls in New York. And he proceeded to walk across it. He came back again. And when he came back, the audience cheered. He was tremendous. And then he got a wheelbarrow. And he put it up on the tightrope. And he walked across. And he walked back again. And he jumped off. And the crowd went wild. And he said to them, do you think that I could take this wheelbarrow across the falls with a man in it, go to the other side and come back? And they said, yes, yes. Do you really believe it? Yes, yes. Are you sure? Yes, yes. And he looked at the man standing next to him and said, okay, jump in. That's the difference between believing in God and the full commitment that Jesus requires with discipleship. Jesus does not call us to be mere spectators. He does not call us to be mere bystanders. He does not call us to simply watch the parade as it goes by. He calls us to step into the wheelbarrow. He wants us to really commit ourselves. He wants us to give up the things of this world to follow him completely and utterly. And that was, that's what a disciple does. But that's what the rich young man cannot grasp. In fact, the story is one of hubris. The rich young man comes to Jesus rather satisfied with himself. He thinks he's done it already. What do I need to inherit the, do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus tells him, well, you need to follow the law. And he says, I already do that. I already do that. I do all kinds of good things. What he's really doing is saying to Jesus, check that box. That's done. I'm ready for the next challenge. Set me the next test, Jesus. I've got that love thy neighbor thing down. What else do you have? It seems clear that he might have been expecting approbation. But what he got was his wish, a harder challenge. Jesus is really saying here today, if you think you've done well, if you really think you have the whole love thy neighbor thing down, if you think you're all sorted with the world, then try this. Give up the things of this world and follow me totally. Now note, as I said before, Jesus is not condemning wealth. He decidedly does not say that to be a good Christian, you must give up everything. What he is saying is that if you really have perfected the task of loving your neighbor on a day-to-day -day basis, if you really are at peace with the world around you, if you are really ready for the ultimate challenge, then here it is. Drop everything and follow me. Impoverishing oneself and going off to do Christian ministry full-time is one way of doing it, but Jesus does not demand it. On the contrary, he demands that we love God in our own way and in whatever walk of life we are called. C.S. Lewis puts the problem this way. All our merely natural activities, all our earthly activities will be accepted if they are offered to God, even the humblest. And all our earthly activities, even the noblest, will be sinful if they are not. The work of a Beethoven and the work of a charwoman become spiritual on precisely the same condition, that of being offered to God of being done humbly, as being done as to the Lord. A mole must dig to the glory of God and a cock must crow. 
and we are members of one body, but differentiated members, each with his own vocation. To be clear, Jesus never tires of reminding us how difficult being one of his followers can be. He reminds us, though, that the best followers are those who are going about his business on a daily basis, whether we are the charwoman or the next Beethoven. When we live our lives in this world in the way he wants us to live it, we do his work. The challenge, of course, therefore, is to be a true follower in whatever walk of life in which, to which we have been called. Indeed, that is in fact the challenge of today's lesson. Are we ready to follow Jesus as his disciple, come what may? It might be uncomfortable at times. It might even be dangerous. Not physically, but socially, economically, and perhaps politically. We don't know when the call will come or what might ultimately be required of us. But when it does, we need to be ready. We need to be fully committed to getting into that wheelbarrow. Amen.
I'd first like to welcome everybody. We have some new friends here, new faces, faces from Rutgers, but I would very much like to thank our angelic choir uh, from St. Albans Scholar. Thank you for all the hard work I'm sure you've put in for that, making it just beautiful and enhancing our service. We hope you'll come back and do it again. Um, you will see on the back of the bulletin that there are several events listed uh, for New York Welsh. So I won't go through them all, uh, but I would note Tom Chandler, who is one of our community, um, is in train spotting, which I have not seen, but is supposed to be excellent. And also Paul Miller is going to be performing at Carnegie Hall, the Requiem, Souls of the Righteous, on November the 11th. Uh, I'd like to remind you that next service is Remembrance Sunday service, so there will be communion. So with those accepting the offering, please come forward.